Hello guys and welcome back to the Splint Course, a bonus module. As you see, I am now dressed in black because some of you said that the blue on blue wasn't great. Shame, I made a 10 plus hour course with that color scheme. I'm so sorry, but I'm hoping going forward now any bonus content, I can wear black so I can, I can stand out more and stand out better for you. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed the course so far. Some of you may be into a few module, modules and you're sort of hand-picking certain lectures, which is totally cool. Uh, others have completed the entire course. I'm so proud of you. Well done. Uh, and I'm hoping that you can re-watch certain elements when you've got a specific type of case or a specific patient. In this lecture, we're going to talk about daytime power function or uh, awake bruxism and how you can manage it with an appliance, but more importantly, when to manage it with an appliance. It's something I, I seldom do, but it's a good trick to have up your sleeve for certain patients. So in the literature, it's referred to as AB, which is awake bruxism. And the incidence in the literature is, is higher than sleep bruxism. And you have to think, why is that the case? Now, if you remember back to module uh, one and two, the evidence base that looks at the prevalence of bruxism is mostly dependent on self-report and questionnaires. So people are not very aware of the power function in their sleep, they're also not very aware of power function during the day until we have the conversation that I'm going to teach you to, to have with your patients. But it's something that they're more likely to be aware of than their sleep bruxism. So that's why we think that the incidence of awake bruxism is higher. It may not be true, but it's because of the fact that we're awake and we're conscious and we pick up on this. Oh yes, I do clamp my teeth together. So that's the kind of thing that I think skews the data. Awake bruxism is something that's really correlated with anxiety. So um, we find that people who have nervous traits, uh, panic disorders, anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety, that kind of stuff, they are more likely to exhibit uh, awake bruxism. But it can affect anyone. It affects me as well. Uh, as I'm doing my dentistry, I'm often posturing my mandible forward. So as I'm, as I'm drilling, as I'm cutting cavities, I'll often catch myself out protruding my mandible. And it's something that I want you to screen every patient for as part of your usual sort of conversation that you would have with your patients. One thing that you could also ask is um, the following. You say, at rest, do your teeth touch together? At rest, do your teeth touch together? And the most common response I get is, um, I don't know, I've never thought about this. And the scary thing is that some people think that they should be touching their teeth together and that's normal. So I've got a few patients I've met over the last few years whereby by having this conversation, I've discovered that their default state at rest is for their teeth to touch together because that's what they think is normal. And once you find these patients and you can just give them a good shake and say, no, that's not normal. Your teeth should be apart. Like that is such a powerful impact on their life you can have. So it's all about communication and it's all about planting that seed. And what I would encourage you to tell everyone and it's something you covered earlier on in the first few modules is our teeth should only touch together for 18 minutes a day. And usually when we swallow, so that's like educating them. And the mantra I always condone is lips together, teeth apart. And once you get them to repeat this a few times, lips together, teeth apart, they can really internalize that and really understand that actually our teeth really shouldn't be touching together during the day. And then they will catch themselves out during the day. And you'll be amazed because once these patients come back six months later for their recall exam, they will tell you that, like, oh my gosh, I can't stop thinking about you. Ever since you told me about my teeth potentially touching together, I've realized I do it all the time. And it's amazing how many of these patients you will collect over time. And they become lifelong patients because like, I, I often joke that sometimes my patients think of me when they're teepee brushing because of the way I teach them teepee brushing. And they come back to me and say, you know what, Jazz, when I'm brushing my teeth, you're in my head. And they're always thinking of you. And it's a conversation that not many dentists have with their patients about awake bruxism and awareness. So when you start, um, tapping into their minds, they will keep thinking of you in the sense that they'll remember that, oh yes, I shouldn't be touching my teeth together because Dr. So-and-so said I shouldn't. Now, one difference between sleep bruxism, SB, and awake bruxism is that awake bruxism is actually more protrusive and also clenching. So people clench in the day and the protrusive type movement we see is actually uh, quite classic of awake bruxism, whereas sleep bruxism is pretty much exclusively left to right left to right. So that's a pattern we're seeing. Some of this exception might be people with sleep apnea who may at night time be going in weird and wonderful positions to improve their airway capacity. So the default management I would advise for all your patients is not an appliance for daytime bruxism. Okay, it's not an appliance. Okay, you should always try advice and counseling. And I'm going to go over that a little bit in a moment about how I do it, the exact approach uh, and potentially an appliance for their sleep bruxism. 
okay? Because once you get them aware about awake bruxism, a lot of patients will be able to manage it just by giving themselves a slap on the wrist. So that's exactly what I say. I say, give yourself a slap on the wrist if you realize your teeth are touching together during the day. So remember, 18 minutes a day only, and you want to constantly reinforce this. And then what you could say is that, hey, if you're really struggling, I can make you a habit breaker appliance, something that you can wear during the day. And then what's going to happen is really interesting from there, right? Because those patients who are, A, really struggling to take that advice on board, like now they realize, whoa, my teeth are touching together during the day when they shouldn't be, and whoa, I'm, I really want this not to be an issue, I really want to solve this, this group of patients will automatically come to you in the future and say, hey, uh, Jazz, you told me that I could do something about my daytime clenching, can we please explore that because I've tried everything and nothing's working. And that's the best patient because they have self-selected themselves as someone who has um, owned the fact that they have a problem and now they're really motivated for a solution. So the type of counseling that I would advise before even considering an appliance is ACE, okay? So ACE is awareness, i.e. our teeth shouldn't touch. Did you know that? They should not be touching together, lips together, teeth apart. So with all our patients, we can cover the A, which is awareness, okay? The next thing is that when a patient reports, yes, I do tap my teeth together, or yes, they do, and now they've got the awareness, the next stage is context, i.e. I do it when I'm ironing, or I do it when I drive, or I do it whatever. So for me, I do it uh, when I'm drilling cavities. My mandible is thrusted forward, okay? So, uh, and, and, I'm often, and I'm often just lightly clenching at those moments as well. So that's my context. And then it's about the education, okay? You need to explain to them that it's detrimental to their oral health, i.e. Uh, excessive muscle stimulation, uh, more likely to cause cracks and wear on their teeth, et cetera, et cetera, which you know now already. But once they internalize that, then hopefully, through the counseling, they can stop themselves. But those self-selected patients who still need your help, I can show you a solution. Now, the historical appliances that uh, people used to use was like a localized occlusal interference splint, which is what you see in front of you. It's a terrible appliance. It's got these balls by the canines, and some dentists would prescribe this at nighttime, thinking that this would stop their bruxism. But what would happen is that the lower, lower canines would come back completely worn because they've been grinding against the metal. So we know just by wearing an appliance like this, with an interference, it's not going to stop you, okay? And to be fair, who wants to wear a big bulky appliance on your palate with metal showing? No one. The alternative uh, also suggested before is a stabilization splint. Do you really want to wear or do you want your patients to wear this big bulky Michigan or Tanner appliance? I know some patients that do, especially for Tanner, which is supposed to be a little bit easier to wear during the day and easier to get your 24 hours in, but it's not great. And I'm going to show you an alternative, which is the mapper. The other alternatives, i.e. a non-appliance for, for actually uh, working with awake bruxism is medication, but the evidence is really scarce for this. I mean, there is a medication called pregabalin, which has been given to some people with very severe anxiety. And a few case studies are showing that actually this works really well, but again, that's a whole very specialized area and you want to involve, I don't know, a neurologist, someone who's going to be looking after the, a, a doctor at least, who's confident in prescribing um, pregabalin or something like that. So that's out of the scope. I think medications, we don't want to be uh, getting in the realms of medication. Some patients may, you know, ADHD type, severe medical, mental issues, they might benefit from medication, but that's beyond our general dental cohort of patients. The other thing to consider is hypnosis but the evidence is scarce at the moment, whether hypnosis truly can stop you from carrying out awake bruxism. So the solution is a MAPA appliance, that's M-A-P-A, -A, which is Maxillary Anterior Passive Appliance. It's essentially an upper 3-3 Essex with a centric platform, and all that happens, they wear it, and every time their teeth together, it's like, oh, I'm touching, oh, I'm touching. In fact, I've got mine uh, just over here. I don't know how well you can see that, but that's my MAPA, so I'm just gonna put it on for you. It's quite easy to wear. So it's called passive appliance because actually it's really passive. It's not so passive that it's gonna fly out my mouth, but it's really easy to remove. Uh, and it's allowed to be a little bit more passive than your nighttime appliance because it's something that you wear when you're awake, when you're conscious, right? So it's all the function it has is as a habit breaker. And all that happens is that when I close together as I'm daytime or awake power functioning, then I'll be contacting on that centric platform there. Uh, and that'll be like, oh, I'm touching, oh, I'm touching. So it's pretty much a reminder habit breaker. Now, technically, this is an AMSA, right? 
So why shouldn't we be using a B splint instead? So this is the B splint I wear every night. Why use a mapper, uh, an, an additional appliance, rather than a B splint that they're perhaps already using? Let me show you why. Okay, I've got my mapper appliance at the moment. You see it's quite, um, so you have to warn your patient of slight speech difficulties. Uh, and it's um, really comfortable actually, it's, it's, it should be very loose. The thing about mappers is it should be very loose, it shouldn't be tight. And I've, uh, one of my colleagues once gave a very tight one and it's not a good thing to have. So anyway, it should be very passive, very easy. Patients do get used to it, their speech does improve. And it's just that when I bite together, it just touches my lower inside. It's like a habit breaker. It makes, it's sort of like a reminder therapy that my teeth are touching when they shouldn't be. So which would you rather wear? Would you rather wear the B splint during the day or would you rather wear the mapper? Now with the mapper, you already have a bit of a lisp going on. So it's something that I, I do say to patients that if you have a, a job where you're doing lots of speaking and communicating, uh, it's going to take a long time to get used to it and you may ne never get rid of, this, of the lisp, uh, as you can see there. But it's still way better than wearing a B splint during the day. You could totally still wear a B splint during the day, to some degree, uh, as long as you're not in a public uh, role. But it's just smaller, easier, more compact, uh, and it's nicer to wear than a B splint. The protocol is so easy. It's like the easiest appliance ever to fit. It's passive, right? You just give it to them, uh, and as long as they can insert it and remove it and know how to clean it, that's essentially it. I seldom have to adjust anything on there. Now, if in doubt, and you think that this patient for, because they've got some other issues like severe anxiety issues, like medical disorders, they're on other medications, that they will actually still be awake bruxing to a high degree, then I probably would do some adjustment to make sure I can to get maybe two incisors at least contacting on that centric platform. But really, this appliance is made for normal people who, uh, when you bring your teeth together, it's like, oh, I'm touching, oh, I'm touching, and they completely disengage and they stop contacting. So it doesn't really matter which incisor or how many incisors are touching at any one point because it's just a reminder therapy. So a really good question that you could ask now is what about over eruption? If a patient's wearing a segmental appliance, i.e. like a, my, my little bee splint or my um, I wear a dual arch, uh, if they're wearing a segmental appliance at night and a mapper during the day, will the teeth not over erupt? That's a good question. Okay, so if you want to completely mitigate this, then why don't you make a full coverage appliance? It could still be an AMSA, but it could be a full Essex with a B splint at night time, so the teeth are all covered. And maybe just a few hours a day for the mapper. The mapper really is, remember the context, the ACE, the ACE of counselling, is we've got to figure out when this awake bruxism is actually happening. Uh, figure out what their triggers are. And that's the time they need to be wearing the mapper, not all the time. So it's only for a few hours a day. But even if they wore, like what I do, a, a, a B splint at night that doesn't cover all their teeth, and a mapper uh, uh, during the day, which doesn't cover all their teeth, that's a lot of hours potentially where their back teeth aren't touching, right? But as Barry Glassman, my mentor taught me, who taught me all about this appliance, is that as long as they're chewing food uh, without the appliance in, and the PDL is getting um, stimulated, then over eruption shouldn't happen, okay? So take that however you will, you practice how you want. I'm totally comfortable, but at the same time in the real world, I'm quite sensible, okay? Because uh, I don't want to leave myself vulnerable and open to any problems. So quite often, if I know that this patient is likely to receive a mapper from me, I'll probably design their AMSA, their nocturnal or their sleep bruxum appliance to be full coverage. It's just safer, makes more sense. So to summarize, it's a short-term wear, like, a few hours and even then for a few months get them to wean off it like it's not a sexy appliance yes it's easy to wear their b splint but you want to totally encourage them like don't become dependent on this it should be something that's going to alarm you as to when and how long it's happening and it's to empower you to eventually stop your habit and definitely just try counseling first and that will then self-select the motivated patients who will then ask for the mapper and more likely to comply with the mapper. You definitely need to warn them about their speech. It's not ideal for those people who are who are working in, a, in an environment or, or, or concerned about awake bruxism in an environment where they're speaking a lot. It's just going to be uh, very difficult with the lisp. The lab fee is approximately £100, and I would usually charge half an hour of clinical time. It doesn't take very much, maybe uh, a scan and a fit and the review I can do at the checkup, so it doesn't take that long at all, and uh, I just add the lab fee on. So that's a, a good way to do it. 
So I hope you could now make some mappers for your patients. Maybe if you are an awake bruxes, how about you make it for yourself uh, and let me know how it goes. Remember to go on the, our little Facebook group and, and let us know how you're getting on. Ask any questions. Always very happy to help you.